of your course materials if you have them with you. The cover has this image on it. Just have a little peek at her. Yeah. Which is the same as this up here, only black and white. <laughs> okay, so um, because this is the, the time of day of tiredness, yes, this is the time of day where sometimes we hit a little bit of a... <sighs> right? Um, it's, uh, I thought, to give you a very different technique than what we've been talking about, just to see if it'll help for this very time of day. Um, so we're going to do just a really simple visualization and mantra to do with Tara. Tara is the Buddha on the cover of your packet. And so for those of you that aren't Buddhist um, or aren't as used to the whole concept of deities and mantras, I'll just give you some context so you're not freaked out. Um, <laughs> the idea is, is that with all of these, all of this iconography, all of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that we talk about, there's several levels of meaning. Okay, so there's kind of like the folk story of this particular deity, Tara. There's the um, Tara-ness in our teachers and in ourselves that we're trying to develop and awaken. There's also um, the qualities that this particular Buddha embodies, which are more like archetypal, right? Do you know what I mean when I say archetypes? So there's, there's many levels of meaning that we're talking about with Buddhist Tantra. And when we're um, doing meditations to do with these images, we're using a different part of our brain. And we're kind of connecting with something that is a little bit less conceptual, a little bit more um, experiential. So if you look at what she looks like, she has one foot out. She's not sitting in that traditional meditation posture. She has one foot out. And the reason she has one foot out is it's indicating that sometimes the enlightened mind has to be ready to jump up and take action. Yeah? She has one foot drawn in, shown sometimes you need to subdue your attachment. She's feminine because feminine represents wisdom. So uh, all of the interesting thing about Buddhist iconography is that you're connecting with different aspects of yourself, essentially, right? We all have feminine aspects and masculine aspects. Um, we all have aspects that are more quiet and peaceful and aspects that are more fiery. And if we can bring this kind of enlightened mind to all of it, then we're going to be happier and of more benefit. So if we have like an external representation of this energy that we want to connect with, it can give you a bit of a boost. So you could think, um, if you are someone who identifies as Buddhist, you could think that all of the enlightened energy of all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas takes this form. It could take any number of forms. It could take many forms. It could take the form of the Virgin Mary. It could take the form of your cat. Right? It's, it's just a form, don't get lost in form. But if you decide to connect with this form, there are certain elements that are helpful, like the, just that simple image of one leg out, ready to jump to the aid. Connecting with that, it does something internally with you. So the visualization, before we even do it, is to imagine her at the crown of your head, yeah? facing the same direction as you, radiating green light. And that green light kind of flows down into you, giving you some boost and some energy. And if you are not at all religious, totally secular, think this is a bit woo-woo, that's totally fine. Um, it's interesting to just experiment with what color does as well. So if the form kind of triggers you, if it's a bit too far out, just think radiant green light. Because we all know that sometimes when we're in nature, surrounded by green, we feel a certain way. When we're at the ocean, looking at blue, we feel a certain way. Different colors do have a different aspect and a different impact on our mind. It's interesting to just play with that a little bit and see what happens. So just treat it as an experiment. Don't feel like you need to do anything or believe anything. Just kind of play with it. But if you feel comfortable to have this image of Tara in green above the crown of your head representing enlightened energy, protection and action, okay? And then what we'll do is just a short visualization and then we'll add the Tara mantra to that. Again, if you don't feel comfortable, just, you know, green, 
that green is good, right? Um, but if you do feel comfortable, you can join me in the mantra once you get the hang of it. So the mantra is Om Tare Tutare Ture Soha. And I'll chant it many times and you can just join in when you feel comfortable or just listen to it or go to your happy place and think of a song on the radio, okay? So whatever you feel comfortable with. All right, so we'll just use that as our motivation for the second half of the day. <clears throat> so just finding a straight way to sit. And thinking may I have internal energy and external energy in order to progress on my path so I can be of greatest benefit to all. And you can put that into your own words. Just come back to your motivation. And then visualize a few inches above the crown of your head is a broad open lotus flower. On top of that is a sun disk and a moon disk. And seated on that is Aryatara, the embodiment of energy, action, and protection, radiant green in color. Her left foot is drawn in. Her right foot is outstretched. And she's radiant with the vibrancy of youth. And so just have an impression of that energy above the crown of your head. And think, may I embody these qualities and be supported by these qualities. And in response, radiant green light flows down, entering your body, connecting with your mind. Just be visualizing radiant green light filling you up, clearing fatigue. And imagine that the green light doesn't just
waiting, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, procrastination is that putting off mind that does want to do something like spend more time with your friends, spend more time with your children, spend more time with your partner, look more deeply into philosophy, meditate more often, get some exercise, eat better. You know, it wants to, but tomorrow. Yeah, that's procrastination, right? Um, attachment is attachment to these crumbs of happiness that we were talking about last night. It's this exaggerated idea that the stuff that we do to fill in time is worth the time we give it. Like Netflix, <laughs> right? Like gossip. Yeah, like excessive phone scrolling. These things that actually are a large chunk of time in the day are related to attachment because they do give us a little bit of happiness. It's not like they don't give us any, but they're the crumbs. Yeah, and we're satisfied with crumbs because we don't often make the effort for more. But this attached mind, you're attached to things that are lesser, which means you have no energy for things that are greater. The last one is despondency, which is like depression, but it's, it's kind of like apathy as well. Do you know this word apathy? Yeah, don't care. Yeah, don't care. What is the point? What does it matter? It's all pointless. Yeah, what, what is worth this effort? That very kind of um, sad, angry, tired. <laughs> Yeah, you know the sad, angry, tired, yeah. <laughs> but added to that is also I'm bad. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic, yeah. Um, so despondency. So these three in a Buddhist tradition is called laziness. Yeah, it's confronting to name them as laziness, but all three of these are forms of laziness. And laziness kills your energy. Yeah, it, the, it's like, it's like la laziness, you have the thing you want to do and laziness drags, behind, you know, and it won't let you do it. It's like hanging on to your feet so you can't walk forward, is what laziness does. It slows you right down. Yeah, and that in that slowing down it feels like relief or relaxation, but actually it keeps you stuck. But there's also the form of this laziness, which is the laziness of busyness, which is what we're encouraged to have in our society, which is to be very active with a number of projects and a number of activities to look like we're worthy. Yeah. Yeah, if you are a busy person, you are a good person. That is not true, right? But this is the, the lie that we're sold. And... So we have to really identify when do these three pop up in us, because all three will occur, but we probably have one that's like our favorite. <laughs> yeah? So um, the laziness of procrastination, this one, um, this one is very common, but you want to ask yourself, what am I doing this instead of? Yeah, when you're doing something that you know is a little bit unnecessary, that you're putting off doing something, you ask yourself, what am I doing this instead of? Instead of meditating, I'm farting around on the internet. <laughs> yeah? Instead of talking to my partner and connecting with them, I'm going to binge watch this season on Netflix. Yeah? Instead of, instead of. You re it makes you recognize the cost. Because if you just look at the activity on its own, it's not that bad, right? The thing that you're doing isn't that bad. It's not causing any harm. You're not hurting anyone. What's the problem binge watching Netflix or farting around on the internet or gossiping endlessly with your friend or just kind of, you know, fiddling with stuff, pottering in the garage, building stuff? You know, whatever your form of procrastination takes, the activity might not actually be that bad of an activity. Yeah, compulsively renovating the bathroom. I don't know what you do, right? <laughs> but, you know, whatever your form it takes isn't necessarily the problem. The problem is why and what are you doing it instead of? Yeah, so, so these are the questions you want to ask yourself when you notice yourself I am putting something off and I'm not even sure what it is I'm putting off, but I'm going to do this familiar activity because it's comfortable and it's comforting. Yeah, I'm not going to look at these bigger things because I know I can get a little satisfaction if I keep doing this same old thing. 
Do you know what I mean? When you get into this headspace, I'm gonna do the same old thing I do every day because it's, it's good enough. Maybe I could do more with my life. Maybe I could do more with my relationships, but this is a sort of something to do. Let's do that. Um, and so sometimes before you get on a roll with one of these activities, to just sit for a while and be bored. Yeah, because we're not used to being bored so much anymore. Yeah, we used to sometimes get bored on public transportation if we forgot the newspaper. Yeah, but then you might look around and think about stuff, <laughs> right? Now we all have our phone, right? And you can always be entertained if you want to be. You can be entertained the whole time. So without boredom, there isn't the space for creativity sometimes. Yeah, without just some space in between, you're not asking, why did I just do that? And why am I about to do this? Transitions are really powerful times. Transitions between activities, transitions between uh, sitting and standing, standing and walking, to the computer, from the computer, outdoors, indoors, any transitional period in your day where you're going between things, to just ask yourself why. And am I doing it instead of something else bigger that's more important? I'm just a little bit scared of because it's going to ask more of me. Do you know what I mean? So this laziness of procrastination, this putting off, it also, when you actually know what you're putting off, if there is something that you need to do, you want to do even, but you're not doing it, you're saying later, 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 all of the time that it comes up into your head and you tell it later, wastes energy yeah it takes so much energy to not do the thing you might as well do it but we don't think of it in terms of an energetic cost the the act of putting off actually does tire you out because you have to justify why you're not doing it you have to prove to yourself why it's valid for you to wait maybe you have to explain yourself to other people you know you have to get very busy with something seemingly more important so that it's not in your mind buzzing it actually can really tire you out to put something off do you agree yeah Sometimes you put something off because it needs time, because you need to wait and think about it more. That's not the same thing. That's not what we're talking about. Sometimes you do need to wait before doing something, just to check, ask it more, be, be curious. But this, this really active, not yet, that, not yet, it, it does exhaust us more than we realize. And so why do we do it, do you think? Why do we procrastinate? Yeah, yeah, you're afraid that once you actually start, maybe you can't do it? Yeah. Yeah? It feels a little bit good. Yeah. In the moment when you're like, I'm going to put it up. Yeah, it feels like a little present you gave yourself. Yeah. I'll do it later. And you're like, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And you have a little moment. Yay. A relief. Yeah. A relief feeling. And once or twice, maybe okay. And then it becomes like a mm, tomorrow, mm, tomorrow. And then you have the anxiety of having put it off. And then the deadline is shrinking. And yeah, but you're right. It does at first feel like relief or it feels like a kindness to yourself. Yeah. I also think it just feels like it's easier to do that than to do the other things. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the other thing's going to take too much effort. I'll just do this tangible thing that's a little bit more obvious, you know, and then I can be tick. That is done. Satisfied. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it can feel easier because the um, Thing that you're putting off is more unknown. Yeah. You don't know where to start. It's, it's more yep. Yeah, it is. It's more difficult. It's less tangible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that when you're not sure how to start and you're not sure how it will end, you can say to yourself, I'm not going to start yet, which is different than saying, I'm not going to do it yet. Yeah, you're like, okay, so I'm not quite ready to start. What needs to come before starting? Yeah, we're not necessarily that strategic, 
Yeah, sometimes we just wait until we're in a panic and then just do the best we can given the tiny time frame we've left ourselves. And then also we can justify it not being perfect because we didn't give ourselves enough time. Yeah, you can say, of course it's not as good as it could be because I only did it last night. Yeah, even though you knew about it for a week. <laughs> Yeah, if you'd given the whole week, it could have been something more and amazing. But then if it wasn't more and amazing, what excuse do you have? Yeah, yeah. Um, I find myself uh, putting things out when there's confusion about what direction to go. Yeah. What is most important. And maybe that can be... Partly like a self perception, but yeah. but it's also real. I, I sense it's a real problem sometimes. Yeah. What, what, what priority it is. Yep, it's the priority. Most, uh, yeah. Important. Yeah, I think you're right. And and then you know, is it procrastination or is it just time to clarify? You know, because sometimes it's both, but sometimes it is you just need time to clarify your priorities, and that's fine. Um, or you need to bounce ideas off of someone. It's, it's a real, um, it's like a sensation when you've decided, mm, not yet. Do you know what it feels like in your head when you really know you should, you really know you can, but you're like, mm, no. <laughs> yeah? That, <laughs> right? Mine is obviously about seven years old, <laughs> but you know, it, it's got a real, mm, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I, the question is, is how has this interrupted some of the things in my life that could have been a lot more powerful, a lot more interesting, a lot more engaging, if I had given them my full attention? But because I put it off, it wasn't as good as it could be, and now I'm even more disappointed in myself. Um, what are all the things we've put off that maybe um, we can never go back to? You know, there's conversations with people that who are now dead, but we kept putting them off, and now we can never have that conversation with them. You know, what what is lost because of a habit of if it's too hard, I'm going to just wait until I'm in a panic or it's no longer relevant. Because sometimes we get a real habit that I will just keep putting it off until I'm in a panic and do it in a frenzy, or I put it off so long it no longer means anything or is important to do, so it just solves itself. Yeah, sometimes these are in our inbox, right? I'll come back to that email, I'll come back to that email. Oh, it's too late now. Anyway, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I'm going to structure to come to structure this, uh, is some fear to have a structure. Yeah, fear of structure. Because what would structure do to you? I don't know why. <laughs> then you're trapped. Are you trapped if you have a structure? Does it prison, imprison you? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it's like a rebellious feeling. I don't, I don't want to. Don't tell me what to do. Structure, even if you told yourself what to do, you're rebelling against yourself. Yeah, and often it's rebelling against ourselves. It could be that you want to meditate, and then you're like, I'm not going to meditate, like rebelliously, forgetting you were the one that told yourself to. <laughs> yeah, you're like having a fight with yourself. Yeah, and then you're going to go to the store and buy healthy food this time, and you go shopping, and you're like, I don't know, I don't want to, I'm not going to, and you. You know, forget that you were the one that wanted to eat healthier, but you're having some sort of rebellion. Yeah, sometimes we, we it's, it's fear. Sometimes it's just simple fear of what will happen if I actually try. There's less fear of, I know what will happen if I half try. If I half try, something useful will come out of it, but if it's not perfect, I can forgive myself because I know I could do better if I gave it more effort. But I'd rather not give it more effort and be proven that I can't do more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, um, um, one of the most common things that, that come up with, um, um, when I teach people in, in business to the mindfulness and stuff. Mm. You know, what if something important comes up? What should I do? Should I write it down? Or so sometimes 
we also need, sometimes it's, it's good to just let things go, but I guess there's also yeah. to be really uh, clear about your priorities. Yep. Because some things we kind of want to procrastinate because they're not actually important, so we can just let them go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, and letting go feels much different than putting off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it wasn't important in the first place. Yeah, exactly. You realize I haven't been doing that because it didn't really need to be done. <laughs> yeah, and that can be very freeing. Yeah. Isn't that almost the opposite? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's not important. You know? Yeah. Because I was thinking also when you talked about procrastination, like, like you know, I'll start next week, even next yeah. year. It can also be the opposite. You know, I have to cook everything from scratch. I have to always do everything. Yeah, yeah. Instead of doing what you really want. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. You can procrastinate uh, in all sorts of different ways. <laughs> and uh, you can have the opposite problem of procrastination, which is um, everything must be perfect and I have to do everything always. That's also sort of procrastination. Yeah, it? yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's interesting. Our minds are very crazy. <laughs> I was just going to ask about uh, like, uh, the uh, perfectionistic uh, tendency and that leads to procrastination. Absolutely. And uh, so making the right decision, uh, you know, focusing my energy on the perfect. Uh, exactly. For me. Um, do you have any sort of yeah. or references uh, to read more about that? Or? Yeah, because you're putting something off because you want it to be done perfectly. And the idea of it being done perfectly is a little intimidating. And maybe, you know, then it's just, uh, that's a little bit too ambitious or a bit too overwhelming, the perfect way I want it to be done. So I'm just going to put it off because it's a little much. Yeah, for me, it's more the form of confusion about confusion. What, what choice to make. Yeah. Uh, from a perfectionistic angle, I think. Yeah. Do you, do you have any? Well, I mean, you have to define perfectionistic, you know, because the motivation behind it is so key. You want to do it perfectly by whose standard for what purpose? By whose standard for what purpose? Is those good? <laughs> is it a good standard, a good purpose? You know, because that's why we started with motivation with this course, right? If the purpose of your life is transformation in order to be of benefit, then your priorities readjust. Yeah, what is for the greater good? And then you have your little work project, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with the greater good in a specific way. Um, you can ask yourself more questions about it. Yeah, so, you know, the things to read are really about motivation. What is my motivation? Why do I do this? Then what to do first is easier. Yeah, because it's what's for the biggest benefit, not the biggest financial benefit or the biggest status benefit or uh, the biggest whatever worldly reason, but for the greater good. What's going to help harmony in this workplace? What's going to help collaboration in this workplace? What's going to help me challenge myself to learn a new skill? Or what's going to help me um, become more clear about where I need more training? or where I'm really, really helpful and I can even do more in that area. You know, if it's coming from that perspective, things clarify. But sometimes we don't know what to do first or what is the most important because we forgot the purpose of our life in general. And so, do I do the one that all of my coworkers need me to do first because they're panicking? Or do I do the one my boss says I should do first because he's demanding? Or do I do the one that's not going to interfere with my family life because they want me home more often? Or do I, what do I do, what do I do? Stop, <laughs> come back, what is the purpose of my life? And then what choice is gonna help them enact that in the best way? So, the whole, you know, real problem of our existence boils down to two main difficulties, which are called self-grasping and self-cherishing. So self-grasping is this ignorance that we all have about reality, in particular about our self. So this is really coming down to the root of cyclic existence or bad patterns, negative patterns, which is you think that this self, this me, this I, is inherently existent. It seems independent. 
it seems self-created or spontaneously created and somehow a little bit permanent. Like there's some core of you that is unchanging. Maybe you learn things on the surface, things change on the surface, but as if there's some little core you that is the same as when you were a child and maybe you just come back to it and you know add things to it, but it's always been there innately you, which is an illusion. Yeah? And the illusion is also that you are fundamentally separate than other or that even other exists at all. So this illusion is problematic in many ways, but it leads to a more obvious everyday problem, which is self-cherishing. And this we can see immediately in our life, the cause of our suffering. Whether you understand this philosophical view about the emptiness of inherent existence and the nature of the self, putting that to one side, because of that, you have self-cherishing, which sees your own needs and wants as of primary importance with indifference to others or at the expense of others. Self-cherishing doesn't just look after yourself. It looks after yourself at the expense of others or with indifference to your impact on others. If you didn't have this core ignorance that thinks that you stand alone, you wouldn't have this self-cherishing that thinks this self needs protection and needs support. Hmm? But because we have this self-cherishing thought, we put off things that are of importance for the greater good and do things that are nice for us as an individual in the immediate. Makes us short-sighted. Yeah, makes us look for instant gratification for this one only. Yeah, it's why we do bad things to the environment. Because it's just me, just today, that doesn't have any impact. It says everyone for hundreds of years, right? And then yeah, very dirty oceans, etc. Yes. So the self-cherishing thought is why there is such strong identity around religion, sadly, and nationalities, and race, and gender, and sexuality, and, uh, I don't know, economic status. All these identity features which make us feel even more separate from each other are constructs. Yeah? They are not the self. They're built on top. And the self itself is not as it seems. The self is only which has been merely labeled on its parts. It seems like there's a core. There's not a core. There's a collection of parts. Yeah. It's very subtle what the eye is. But we have never met the real eye. Yeah, the eye that does exist, the one that does exist conventionally, is that which is merely labeled on the collection of parts or the aggregates. The one that we think we are doesn't exist at all, even nominally. That's scary, right? So take a minute and go, who is this one that needs to be happy? Or who is this one that's burnt out? Or who is this one? Where are they? Who is it? Is it your personality? Let's take that. Okay, let's use that. It's your personality. That's you. Where did your personality come from? Yeah? Your parents, your siblings, your conditioning, your culture, what you've read, what you've thought about, the conversations you've had. Where is the core personality that is you, essentially? Find it. Ah, oh, it's uh, my intelligence. Ah, found it. Really? So when you were a little baby and you couldn't speak, were you the same person? When, at, at what point was your intelligence obvious and you and yours and self-created or independent? Is it your sense of humor? Is it your political beliefs? Anything you start to point to as you is learned. You didn't make it. Yeah? And yet it's there. That's fine. Right? No problem. But because you think of it as yours, then anything that interferes with that idea is a challenge to you. And anything that helps is of benefit to you. And you immediately open the door to attachment and aversion. All built on this lie about who you think you are. Yeah? Take something like, uh, I don't know, nationality, right? You're Swedish. <laughs> Where are, you, where are you Swedish? 
what part of your genetics, what part of where you were born, what part of your blood, and you go, oh, okay, this part, this part. Who gave you that? Your parents. Yeah? You didn't make it, your parents. Who made theirs? Their parents. What if you were born over the border? Are you a different person suddenly? What about your gender? Where is your gender? Is your gender in your genitalia? Is it in there? Is that where it is? Is it in your chromosomes? Is it in your thinking? Is it in your socialization? You know, the, the man of one culture acts very differently to the man of another culture. Yeah, the spectrum of these things. And yet it feels so much, this is who I am. No, it was built. It was built. And this, none of this would be a problem except you put I on top of that, and that automatically makes other. And that other better benefit you, otherwise you're mad at that other. So how does this make us tired? <laughs> because all day we're looking for things to support this I, and trying to block things that interfere with this I. And the whole time that I was never there. There is an I, but it's not that one. Yeah? That inherently existent I is a, an illusion. It is not like that at all. It's not there. Yeah? Thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, so then why do you procrastinate, right? <laughs> because, you know, you're, you're trying to get some happiness for this I or prevent suffering for this I that doesn't exist at all. No wonder our priorities are confused. Yeah, but it's important information to have in the background of this very sort of simple set of teachings on burnout prevention and recovery, which is coming from the Bodhisattva perspective of how to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Intellectually not that difficult, but know that behind it is this other side, which is the very reason why we have negative states of mind is because we don't know who we are. And we're identified with a part of ourself that is not even real. Yeah. Yep. Not procrastinating, but good letting go, yep. <laughs> Where does that decision come from? It's not coming from the eye? It's coming from the mental factor of intention, <laughs> which is one of the pieces you label I on. Yeah. Um, what we're trying to realize is that you it's not like you don't exist at all conventionally. You do exist conventionally, but the one you think you are doesn't exist at all. Yeah, all of that identity about, I don't know, gender and personality and nationality and this is me and this is me. No, that is all just circumstance. Yeah, and then you label I there. But we have to work with it, right? We have to work with it. So the one that decides whether or not to let go or not, that's the mental factor of intention. Yeah, that's the part of your mind that um, moves. Yeah? And it's based on how you label things, which is the mental factor of recognition or discrimination. And the way you label things isn't necessarily accurate, right? And so what we're trying to do with a, a workshop like this is educate that mental factor of discrimination so that it sees things more in alignment with reality. And that means that your choices are better, yeah? Right now, our choices are often based on the mental factor of feeling, right? If it feels pleasant, it must be good. If it feels unpleasant, it must be bad. Forgetting that feelings arise because of the past, not because of the present. Yeah, so we're making um, a decision based on what's just happened, thinking that it's based on what's happening now. And so it's a flawed decision process and then it sets up a whole future pattern. And so if you could say, for example, you have kind of an unpleasant, tired feeling because of a long day at work. Well, is it really because of the long day of work or is it because of the way you started the thinking this morning? Yeah? Hard to say, right? Because if it was effort alone that made you uncomfortable and tired, effort alone would always make you uncomfortable and tired, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes that same amount of effort is no problem. 
yeah? But you can come to this wrong conclusion and then make your choices about the future based on a wrong assumption about what just happened here. So letting go, letting go is asking yourself what is really happening here, not just listening to feeling, not just listening to one piece, but having the big picture in mind. What do I really want to do with this life? What do I actually think is important? And the quickest way to narrow that down is to remember death. Yeah, if you're remembering that you will die and there is no getting out of that, and it could happen any time. Healthy people die before sick people every day. Young people die before old people every day. This is a fact, we know this, but we don't hold it present. We think we have time. But if you suddenly remember, it's possible I don't have time, your priorities recalibrate and you let go of things that aren't important. Do you think that would help if you remember death, that you would let go of the things that aren't important? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Uh, we talked about identity and gender and all this nationality, and then also we talked about motivation and how important it is to remember your motivation. So, isn't there a risk to make your motivation into your identity? Uh huh. Yeah, is there a risk to make your motivation into your identity? Yes, it is very common. I think if you know that you're doing that, it's less dangerous <laughs> than if you don't know that you're doing that. Yeah, um, any kind of strong holding to identity is going to create other. But we do have to function in this world. So, you, you know, to say that, um, I don't know, to say that I'm not American, I'm just a world citizen, isn't quite true. Right? I was born in America and there are certain things that I was socialized to that are part of how I operate in this world. So to pretend that that's not true is not useful. But to say that it is me inherently and that that is inherently somehow different than anyone else means that people from other countries are to be feared. Right? So what we're saying is you can have identity and you can have motivation, but don't identify with your identity. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah, and you have your motivation, but you realize that your motivation itself is the coming together of many conditions, and it might not be the same motivation forever. But right now, given what you've learned so far, this is the best one for the greater good. But it could be with more information and more time, you expand it to something else. So you're holding it, you're using it, you're functioning within it, but it's not you or yours. But the reason why it's, it's draining to, have, uh, to hold on to the identity is because we use too much energy. Trying to maintain it. To, to expectations for <coughs> other people. Yeah. Role, yeah. Instead of just seeing it as yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, identity is more exhausting if you need other people to agree. Yeah? If whatever you think your identity is, isn't really the problem. It's when you think you are challenged if other people don't agree. Like, if you think you're an intelligent person and other people disagree, you feel threat. But if you realize that the concept of being an intelligent person is relative and contextual, then if someone thinks you're unintelligent, you can just be curious. But if it's you, you feel challenged, right? Or like uh, when I'm in India and I try and go to the bathroom, they usually think I'm a man. And they go, sir, sir, you cannot go to this bathroom. And I'll say, please, <laughs> you know, this is for ladies, this is for ladies. I could be so offended that they misgendered me. I could be really offended if I'm really holding a strong identity of, I am a woman, don't you know? <laughs> right? But if I'm like, well, I'm merely labeled woman on a collection of things, but you know, from a distance, who knows, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, you know, then it's just funny, yeah? It's like, whatever, yeah? But you know, you know when um, uh, if someone misgenders you, if you're like, uh, I don't know, it happens to me on airplanes a lot, if I'm sleeping, the flight attendants think I'm a man, and when I open my eyes, they think I'm a woman. It's weird. So they'll be like, sir, 
sir, would you like your meal? Sir. And then I'm like, oh, they're talking to me. And I open my eyes and they go, oh, I'm sorry. <gasps> I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. You know, and whatever. Who are they talking to? Right. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, is like, I could be offended if I'm very much holding to why don't you see me how I see myself, <laughs> right? Um, you know, for a while, people were assuming I was Canadian because my accent is a little indistinct because I was born kind of close to the border. And I kind of like being think thought of as Canadian, right? Because uh, Canadians have a much better reputation, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and so if people were mis mislabeling me Canadian, I was quite pleased. I'm like, oh, they must think I'm approachable and friendly <laughs> and, you know, like this. But, you know, uh, as soon as um, someone says, oh, you're American. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, you can take a hit. But none of that is a problem if you're holding identity lightly, which is not the same as not holding it at all. You know, it's, like, it's sort of like, I sometimes feel like it's like a puppet, yeah? You know, that this is just sort of something I'm operating within, this bag of bones, this set of qualities, these traits, these abilities, these deficiencies. This is just kind of what I'm operating within. Yeah, it, and given this set of things, how can I be of benefit in this world? But no part of this is mine. Yeah, this body, my parents gave me this body and everything I have ever eaten. Yeah, no, it's not mine, <laughs> right? It came from others, but I'm gonna use it because it's the one that's here, you know? <laughs> right, I can't use someone else's, right? Right, that would be weird and inappropriate. <laughs> Right. right, and you know, it could be that um, I could think, okay, well, I have uh, a certain education level, and that that means something. But as soon as someone says, oh, that means you're really well educated, I could go, <laughs> right? Or if they think, oh, you're only that educated, I could, you know, it's all contextual what that means. And yet there is something there. Yeah, so it's it's not the identity so much that is the problem, it's the strong holding, yeah? Because then you're so easily wounded and so easily attached, yeah? If you realize everything is a dependently arisen phenomena, everything comes about because of causes and conditions and parts and mind's imputation, then you can kind of relax. You can let go a lot more easily because nothing is just as it seems. Nothing exists from its own side independently. Yeah? yeah. Could you say something more about like, holding your motivation lightly but still holding it? Right? What, what, what is that like? What, what, how do you do that? It works out quite well. No. <laughs> yeah, no. You're, I mean, to hold your motivation lightly means that you don't have expectations with it. Yeah, so I want to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, right? That's what I want to do. That's my motivation. But sometimes, I, you know, what I'm actually doing that day is, you know, getting on an airplane and sitting for hours. In what way is that moving me towards enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings? You know, I'm sitting, I do some prayers, I read some books, I chat to the person next to me, I see what people are watching on movies, I kind of look around, go for a walk. None of that could have any meaning unless I bring meaning to it. Yeah, but if I bring too much meaning to it, like pressure meaning, then I could start to look for significance where there really doesn't have to be. Yeah, so it's kind of this middle way of, in order to be a benefit to all sentient beings, I need to look after my mind. So if I start getting tense because I'm crowded in this airplane, that is not a benefit to the greater good. Yeah, if I sort of uh, snap at the flight attendant for bumping into me because I had a foot out, that's not a, for the greater good for all sentient beings. If I feel awkward next to the person next to me because they're big or they smell or they're too chatty, that's not useful. But if I think, oh, I am uncomfortable, how do I work with discomfort? That'll be my project, apparently, for the next several hours. <laughs> you know, then it's something to, that's useful, otherwise just something interfering. But if I feel like I have to prove something or achieve something or put too much pressure on it, then I've gone too far. So, so that's the holding it lightly. You have it, but not too much pressure. Yeah, yeah maybe one more and then we'll stop for a cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, so 
so holding it lightly. But then I uh, and I try, and but then I think about the turtle. Turtle. Uh, the story <laughs> of the turtle in the sea, and uh, that it's oh. very very oh. rare. To yep, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. The turtle. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah. <like>, gotcha. <laughs> There's no time. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Back to all the expectations. Yes. It has to be fast. And yes. And yeah, death is coming. And oh my God. And yeah. 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 So how do I balance this? Uh, keep calm and carry on. Yeah. Well, it's it's very it's yeah it's interesting what you're saying. How do you keep a strong motivation but let it go? Remember that this life is so precious. The turtle story is this. The quick turtle story. Um, in the Buddhist literature, they're trying to help us understand that it's actually very rare to be a human being. It's rare, right? They're like just underneath our feet, there are far more beings underneath us than there are in this room who are not human, right? There's tons of ants and worms and all sorts of little insects. There's way more non-humans than humans. Being a human is a big deal because you have the ability to transform and change. Um, you know, dogs can learn a few things, dolphins can learn a few things. There are smart animals out there, but are they thinking I'm going to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings? Let's work on my patience today. <laughs> Maybe not, right? And so the turtle story is, realizing, is to show how rare it is to be a human being, and the idea is that the great Ocean has a little uh, yoke, which is like a wooden thing that uh, used to put, be around cows' necks who were plowing fields. Can you picture that thing that the cows had around their necks when they were dragging the plow behind them? So imagine that is floating on the sea, and there is a blind turtle at the bottom of the sea, and he comes up for air once every hundred years. The chance that that turtle will put his head through the yoke is as rare as it is to be born a human. <laughs> Fun fact, right? <laughs> Fun fact. So the point is not to, to you're like, what? <laughs> what is this folk story? The point of this folk story is that it's rare to be human, don't waste it. That's the point. It's rare to be human, don't waste it. If we are going to live our whole life like an animal, just fulfilling pleasure and avoiding pain, we might as well be an animal because then we would cause less trouble. Yeah? If you're going to live like an animal, it would be better to have been born an animal because a human being living like an animal hurts a lot of things, destroys so much, consumes so much. So it's kind of like, how dare we live like an animal because we're an, a human being? How dare we live like that? Because we can't actually get away with it. Yeah, an animal can just look for food and look for housing and look for a mate and look for play and not hurt anything. Yeah, or maybe just exactly what it needs to survive. A human being living like that will cause huge amounts of destruction. What are you putting back into this world? You know, are you going to spend a whole life consuming and consuming and consuming and then die and say, good luck kids, hope the world doesn't boil into fire while we're away. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about the fossil fuels. Yeah, are we going to just consume or not? Um, and so how do you keep a good motivation remembering that this is an incredibly precious life? And you may or may not believe in future lives, but you believe in this life at least. And this life is very precious, but you don't want to put this pressure on you like, make it meaningful, make it meaningful, make it meaningful every second. And you're like, but I just need to have a shower right now. Do I have to make it meaningful all day? <laughs> And the, and the answer is, is that you can bring profundity to the simplest of things. I think you get tense when you feel like you need evidence. Yeah, you need evidence that you're being productive and that you're making meaning in your life. It comes down to expectation again, right? Exactly. Yeah, it comes down to expectations and attachment. You know, what you're trying to do is create a strong mental habit of may I be of benefit. And if you have a strong mental habit of may I be of benefit, then what you actually do or say is much more likely to be of benefit. But sometimes you don't have to do or say anything, but you're still cultivating that habit just gently in the back of your mind. And you might, maybe all you're doing that day is having a shower. You probably have a shorter shower, right? May I be of benefit? 
to all sentient beings. You might not just go, ah, shower, ah, you know, for hours and waste all the water, because suddenly you realize, oh, I'm not the only one who needs fresh water, you know? But if you're not thinking about this big picture, it's very easy to indulge and give your per yourself permission to just be a raw consumer without putting anything back. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's not about tangible evidence, it's about an internal habit, but that strong internal habit will turn into everyday habits that are really much more kind and beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Can I have a short, stupid question? Short, stupid, yes, go. <laughs> because I also, I also sometimes fly a lot, but like, through, like, because it, is, it becomes like, like, what is it called? Well, no, deep dead. Virtuous. Virtuous, maybe. Virtuous. You shouldn't do this and da 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 da. For me, one part of my brain is wanting to kind of structure it as virtuous. Like, yeah. be vegetarian, don't fly. Yeah, yeah. But I Buddhist fly so much. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's my stupid. Oh, I know, it's crazy. So, that, so, so yeah. one part of me is like this kind of Wait, moralistic yeah, yeah. part of me is like, aha! You fly! Hypocrite! Hypocrite! Hypocrite. <laughs> I found you! Yeah. <laughs> because is there any way to be perfect in samsara? You know? Can you be perfect in this cyclic existence? Is there any way to live that causes no harm? If you were a perfect, fallen fruit, vegan, Jane ascetic, still the apple falling from the tree to the ground might hit something, and you walking across the grass to get the apple, you might kill something. There is no way to live in this world without causing harm to others. It's why we want to get out of cyclic existence. That said, uh, I don't fly for holidays anymore. I only fly if I'm doing something to be of benefit. If, I, if I've been asked, yeah, not imposing, but if I've been asked, I go. And while I'm there, I might see some beautiful things, but that's never the reason for going. I never had like a Sweden agenda. <laughs> I was like, all right, Sweden, all right, why not Sweden, right? And um, left to my own devices, I would just stay at home. But um, as it turns out, it's traditional for uh, monks and nuns to travel all over the place teaching, and it's been that way since the time of the Buddha. Um, you know, it just didn't have airplanes. Yeah, they were more walkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that. But I mean, it's important to check. It's like, gosh, you know, there's this impact. Is what I'm doing enough to offset the damage of that flight? It's tricky, and you're like, well, maybe not, actually. Ah, oh. you know, but it's a good question to ask myself. And sometimes I find myself lacking. It's like, wow, maybe I wasn't enough benefit to justify all that engine fuel. All right, well, next time I'm going to really do even better, you know. But to ask yourself these questions, but to know it will never be perfect, takes the pressure off too, you know. And to know that if you get very tight about being good, other people feel unsafe around you. Like they can't just have an ordinary day and make ordinary people mistakes. If you are really tight about trying to be perfect, it, it suffocates the people around you, you know? Um, you have to give yourself permission to not be perfect and to make mistakes so that other people feel relaxed to be human around you, you know? Yeah, it's, that del it's a middle way. All of this is a middle way between holding a very strong motivation and knowing you will never be able to do it. <laughs> yeah? Or it won't come anytime soon. Yeah? Do I think I'll be a Buddha? Yes, but this life? I don't know. Maybe not. It might take a while. But the, pr the big picture mentality means I live much differently. Much differently than I used to. And much happier with less. So why not? You know? Why not have that big motivation? So anyway, just sit with it and have a little cup of tea and uh, we'll come back at four for the last session. How are you guys doing with this information? Are you feeling interested? Are you feeling bored? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling happy? How are you doing <laughs> in response to these ideas? Inspired. Inspired, yeah. <laughs> Is anyone having some despair or anything? Any, any sadness? Anger. 
because it's okay, yeah, because sometimes um, it's like I'm inspired, but also uh, a little, oh no, there's more to do than I thought, <laughs> or, um, you know, some lots of responses could come up, yeah, you could become uh, annoyed at how much more there is to do with your life, <laughs> um, or too many words to process in too short a time, you know, so whatever is coming up for you, um, I think a good rule for all courses is your approach to the material is as important as the material. Like, what is your response when you're interested? What is your response when you're triggered? You know, kind of how do you move with information coming towards you and marrying up with your own wisdom? Just kind of also having that as a background project. Your approach to learning is as important as what you are learning. Does that make sense? Because then also um, you don't have to feel like squeezing everything into your head. You just take on what you're able to take on and anything that you feel is too much for today you can just come back to or not, you know. So it's not like you need to like force feed yourself anything. Does that make sense? Um, and so just experiment. So I'm guessing with these obstacles to energy, you can see yourself most clearly in one, but probably you do all three at some point. Do you, do you agree? Is there one that kind of jumps out at you as that's probably me? I'll talk a little bit more about the second two, and then we'll do a meditation to try and even more clarify. Um, are there any questions before we go on to those second two a bit more? Yeah, sure. I have questions, but I can wait at the end, otherwise. No, no, sure, go. Like you said that how, how do we feel? Mm -hmm. For me, it was a bit like last part. It was a bit, I feel like I'm confused. Yep. Um, and I also was thinking if I should ask these questions or like just let them be and some, somehow find the, the answer myself. Mm. But uh, now that you ask, we have yeah. to try. <laughs> Out with it. Uh, the first one is, was, was the... Uh, I know that it's probably uh, the answer to that my question could be like what the bigger motivation or the, the seeing is like the whole, but we talked about the things like flying mm -hmm. and um, I think it's sometimes hard to do it in a proper way, like okay, you say I'm not flying so much, but do it like plurally, not just say no, I'm not flying and feeling bad. For example, I live, I, my parents live in a different country, mm -hmm. so I'm from another country, so I fly to visit them, and yeah. said, you know, you don't do that, you don't fly home, but, and I'm thinking, okay, so I, yeah, it's, you know, maybe I shouldn't fly either, but then it would be like, feeling bad and sad, mm -hmm. or flying and blaming yourself. Yeah, we don't want to be black and white, right? Yeah. Like, I, I do fly home, but I don't fly home just to be home. I fly for a purpose, and also then I can see my family. You know, I'm trying to maximize because I know there is a cost to the environment. There is a cost financially and energetically to these big flights. Mm -hmm. And yet the way my life has come together, mm -hmm. I have many responsibilities and obli obligations that are spread all over the world. And that's just how it's come out. Mm -hmm. And so how can I maximize my use of resources? And then in other ways, how can I minimize using resources? Because I know it won't be perfect. Yeah, so to say never or always is too soon for us to be that pure. I also yeah? feel like blame. No, sadness, no. So, so if you fly, you feel blame. Yeah. Like, oh no, I'm doing so, so bad. Or yeah. you do, then you think, oh no, but I'm not going because it's bad. So you go, and, <laughs> oh, I, won't, I won't see my, my parents. And they will I'm cry bad. and they will so, mad at me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Too, like, it's, it seems now that it's two yeah. options for me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, but you, yeah, you say, am I going home right now because I know it's a good time for me to connect and bond and be deep with my family, or am I going home because I hate being here right now and I need an excuse to leave? You know, you're asking yourself why. Is it a, is it a good motivation or is it an escaping motivation? 
Yeah, and you say, okay, so some resources will be used, but also my parents will not be alive forever, and having deep, meaningful connections with them is important. Maybe I can help them with their quality of life by being around them. So sometimes it's good to see them. And sometimes they're fine. They don't need me. They existed before I did. They were fine. You know, so why, where is the pressure coming from and is it always clean? Just asking yourself more questions, even if your parents live next door. You know, whether they live next door or they live across the world, our obligation and our responsibility to each other is something to examine sometimes. Because sometimes when we feel like we need to be with people, it's because they're kind of objectifying us and demanding something from us that is maybe not healthy for them. Okay. And sometimes it's something worthwhile and we need to kind of respect that and make an effort, you know, so you just check. Just check. So the answer is, go see your parents sometimes. It's nice. Yeah? But ask yourself why and why now. You know? To, it's, it's, if people have wound up in your life, we have kind of a, a responsibility to make something good out of that. Yeah? Yeah? It's also good to offset that yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially if you're having some guilty feelings about using resources, there's things you can do to offset that harm. Yeah, um, different, um, contributing to different environmental organizations, being more clear about your purchasing consumer choices. You all know these things, you're very good about them in this country. It's, it's recognizing that it will not be perfect because of the nature of our existence. Yeah. So ask yourself, what is your big purpose? As you said, ask yourself that. But don't ask it lightly. Ask it deeply. Yeah. And, and make sure it's, it was worth the effort. You know, if you make all this effort to go see your family, make it meaningful. You know, don't just go to the movies together, right? I mean, you can go to the movies together if that's meaningful for you. But, you know, if that is all that you do, you know, uh, what was the point of all of that resource consumption? So it's like if you made the effort, make it meaningful. Yeah? Does it, I don't know, does it help? Yeah, it helps. Yeah. It's just that... Uh... Yeah, it's a lot of, it's a side, it's a lot of pointing and blaming. Yeah. It's so hard not to, to get, get, get there, like, not to feel like, guilty for crying. Or, yeah, it's hard. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes other people flying judge me for flying. <laughs> They're like, look, I can fly, but why are you flying? You're a Buddhist nun, you should be better than I, I can fly. <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> And, you know, the thing is, is no one really knows your own motivation. No one really knows your experience. And we actually don't have to justify or prove anything to anyone. It's just we need to be awake to our own motivation to make sure we're not lying to ourselves. That's, that's what we want to work on. And if people are curious about our motivation and want to ask us in a fun, let's play with ideas, conversational way, sure. But if they're just looking for a reason to judge you, they will find some reason, you know? You could never fly again and they will find a different reason to judge you, right? <laughs> people will always find a reason, yeah? It's very interesting. So um, why do people judge you? Because they're suffering. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> because they're afflicted. Not necessarily because you're worthy of judgment. Yeah. It's simple, right? It's cliche. You know these things, but and yet we still are really hurt by either people's judgment or our assumption of people's judgment. Yeah, and sometimes they weren't even thinking of us. <laughs> right? <laughs> they were just living their life, gave us a funny look, but actually there was something cool over there. That's why they looked that way, right? And we're like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can't take things so personally. Okay. So, oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, sure. Regarding procrastination, when you mentioned that sometimes when we procrastinate, and it's like, even you have to write an email because people maybe you won't have a uh, chance or to write if it was in the dialogue. Mm. And I, I have thought about it before. It becomes a bit like the motivation is the fear that you won't be able to do that. Yeah. Is it, is it, yeah. Is it correct motivation? No. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? No, you you yeah. mentioned it, you gave it as an example. So I was yeah. like thinking, even if you procrastinate, it's like, 
I'm afraid that if I procrastinate, I will have little time. And then it's kind of, you do it because you're afraid. Yeah. So it's a bit like also conflict fear. Well, you're looking at many things at the same time, right? On one hand, you're looking at what makes you tired. And sometimes your fear makes you tired. Um, what are the what is the right reason to do something is your bigger motivation but your smaller reason is if I don't do it I will be tired and then I won't be able to do the other positive things in my life so you don't want the main motivation to be an affliction but it can be like a sub a sub reasoning where you know also what will help these other superficial things as well do you know what I mean many things can be true at once yeah, so it's it's not about some kind of weird game in your head where you're pretending to be more pure than you are and saying, this is my motivation, but really it's coming from fear. It's about acknowledging both things can be true at the same time. There's the part of you that is wise and reasonable and rational and wants to be of benefit in this world. That part of you exists. There is also a part of you that is fear-based and afflicted and worries about how people will judge you and wants validation and affection. That part of you also exists. One of them is more reasonable than the other, and you can guess which one, but you know, to say that they aren't both present or both happening often, that would be exaggerating, wouldn't it? But you just consciously, and this is the meditation that we'll be about to do, is to see the two sides of yourself and consciously lift out of one and drop into the other. Yeah, Coming from a place of agitation will increase agitation. Coming from a place of stability will increase stability. The activity itself is not the point. Yeah, either way you're going to wind up writing that email. Right? It's not about the email. It's about where did you decide to make the choice from. Because you could make the choice from either way and still get the email done. Yeah. So you're consciously choosing to come from the right place. I don't know if that, does it help? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but then in the, way you are, the way you answered them, it looks like that it's, the fear that could be, the fear that could be to rage, right? The email is not the right motivation. Depends. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. The fear that it will be too late. I mean, you know, too late and then you will hurt someone's feelings. Too late and then a good thing won't happen. You know, if it's, uh, I would want the good thing to happen, then do it from there. But if it's panic, like, I, I, I will be a bad, bad person if I don't do this thing, that's not healthy. So, you know, again, you divide that into two. Yeah. So it becomes subtle, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What is actually driving me becomes very subtle. Um, and at some point you can say, assume your motivation is mixed. Mm -hmm. Assume your motivation is not perfect, but just gently try and move it more to the side of reasonable and compassionate, just as best as you can with your ability so far, and then let go. This is as good as I can do so far. But each time you make a little bit of effort in the healthy way, it makes it easier. Because repetition is what makes it easier. Yeah. Yeah, so your motivation won't be pure for a very long time. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's just the effort in trying to actively go that way. Hmm. Uh, this whole talk, talk maybe this one, so, uh, mm. trying to keep on track. Um, an experience I had, I worked in uh, sort of international justice, uh, war crimes, and yeah. uh, etc., uh, protecting victims and stuff in, in that area. Um, and often, what I found was we were getting stuck by political um, decision makers yeah. in terms of us being able to do our job and get our uh, objective men in terms of looking at these people. Yeah. Um, and that was going on for a long, long time. Um, and it left me, when I, when I left that job, uh, I had to leave that job, and, and it left me, and I thought I was depressed, but I think respondents mm. would be a better word. Yeah. Um, and also now working in sort of international uh, um, democracy development uh, organizations, seeing people who, you talked about this morning, about leadership and, and, and a different way of leading. Yeah. And too often I see in these organizations where you think maybe you've met that area where, or you're in that area where you can change the world, or you can yep. make a difference in the world. 
often seen the people who are more oriented towards themselves yep. moving into positions of influence and decision making. Yep. Work, ones who are working hard yep. to achieve things are, are left yep. outside that decision making environment. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's I, I think that you're you're hitting the nail on the head of you know when you what if you found really ethical, really important work to do, and even the people that you're working with in the good workplace scenario, it's you wind up feeling oh it's good work, but that's not a good person doing the good work. <laughs> it's a dodgy, politically motivated, you know, self-centered, egotistical person doing good work <laughs> or the name of good work yeah and um and to think maybe they came to this work from a beautiful pure place and then the years went by and they became more egocentric and whatever happened but nevertheless there they are in power and here you all are doing good work and trying to be well motivated but have no power to change you know how do you not get despondent and um, i think this is a huge thing that happens and you know people in power get into power for lots of different reasons, uh, kar karmic reasons and uh, reasons in the immediate and conditions. And I think it's, it's tricky to be someone who is on a spiritual path and still ambitious. Yeah, ambitious for the right reason. Because, you know, we see again and again that power corrupts. Right, someone starts out a really good sort of person and then you put them in a position of power and they become corrupt. Um, or there's a, a saying in the Christian tradition, you know, that uh, sometimes our leaders have feet of clay, you know, meaning that, you know, they, they're sort of good on top and a bit dodgy on the bottom, right? Or, um, you know, what do you do when you find out people you really respect have made a big mistake? You know, how, how do we reconcile all of that and don't become defeated? You know, like all the air is gone. And I think part of why the air goes in the first place is we had an expectation that leaders could be perfect. Yeah, or we had an assumption that people in leadership deserve their leadership when that's often not the case. They just wound up there. You know, and so working with attachment while still at the same time having forward momentum, it's like a spiritual maturity. It's a maturity which is not blind to the fact that people are egotistical and badly motivated and full of pride and full of arrogance and yet still might have a little light inside of them <laughs> that still might be able to do some good. And us as people working with them can kind of find and nourish that spark if we're not the person in power. If we're just frustrated at all of the ways they're inconsistent and badly behaved, we just are like hitting our head against a wall and getting sad and depressed. But if we're going, okay, this is only to be expected. The more power people get, often the worse they are behaved. It's a very rare individual that gets more power and becomes better behaved, you know, they, that they wear their responsibility well. And we'd like to think that if we had a lot of responsibility, we'd be one of those rare leaders who wore it well. But sometimes someone could just like put us in charge of, I don't know, putting the chairs out. We're in charge of that. And suddenly we become a tyrant. No, not like that. I am in charge. <laughs> you know, the smallest task, right? So we'd like to think that we'd be different, but you know, would we? We're actually, it can't be sure. So if you can kind of have the assumption that our leaders will be faulted. Our leaders will be faulty. Yeah, our leaders will not live up to our expectations and our hopes of them, and yet still maybe there's a way good can be done. How do I kind of hold the truth that there's some really unfortunate aspects and still work with the little light that's still there so it doesn't go out completely? And if for some reason you have the window to get into power to wear it well, you know, and to not let the fact that people are looking up to you mean that you're worthy of being looked up to. <laughs> you just wound up there by some fluke of circumstance, by some trick of karma, by some causes and conditions. So, ah, you're in charge. Wear it well. Yeah, but not also be afraid of being in a leadership position just because you're a spiritual person on a spiritual path that somehow it's not allowed to be in leadership. It's fine to be in leadership, good to be in leadership if you're working on your pride. 
you know. So there's a lot of interesting ideas in uh, the tantric side of Buddhism, which is about adopting a persona in order to subdue other people's negative states of mind. But there's a non-tantric way of kind of approaching that, which is like adopting the attitude of being uh, proud and confident and assertive and big in your energy while knowing in the back of your mind that you're full of nonsense. Yeah, and, and knowing that about yourself and having a sense of humor. And if someone were to say, you're full of nonsense, you would say, I am, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and, but, and yet still kind of holding that space of, I'm going to take the role of the leader in this job, yeah? And then just as easily, I'm going to take the role of servant in this job and just kind of trying on different hats and realizing that you can, yeah? Take on the role of leader, why not? You saw, actually, you're in a good position to realize people who wind up with leadership don't always deserve it. Might as well give it a try, right? You won't make it worse, probably, right? But the despondency, it's hard to see the relationship between attachment and depression or attachment and feeling defeated or feeling deflated or despondent, but there was an expectation there that was never possible to be met. And it's seeing that clearly is so disillusioning. Yeah, and it's poignant and it's why people burn out. But if from the outset or now recalibrating, you know, starting from now, you assume people will be motivated by their afflictions, then you're not going to be surprised when they behave badly. You're going to be surprised when they behave well and happy about it, you know? It changes things. It's a healthy cynicism, you know? And um, it's also not like punishing towards them because of behaving badly. You, you assume they will, yeah? Because how few people look into life deeply and look into their motivations deeply? Not many people have come across the, the conditions to have a conversation like this and look at why do they do what they do, you know, and it's certainly not encouraged in kind of normal society. And so what, you know, what do we expect? So we can't also kind of be looking down on them for being so petty. We should be just more amazed that they ever do anything good. Yeah, we're all really badly motivated, <laughs> frankly. And um, that can give you a lot of pressure relief when you realize that. Yeah, that the people you look up to will fail you. It doesn't have to make you depressed. It can just, it's more information. Yeah, if you think that uh, there's a perfect kind of person out there that you can always rely on, that's dangerous. Yeah, like, you know, what if you were Catholic, right? And uh, ha had a priest that you loved as a child and thought was amazing and really inspired your mind and nothing happened to you, but then years down the track you found out they had abused one of your friends. You might throw out all of the beautiful wisdom you learned from them because they did a horrible thing, forgetting that wisdom is owned by no one. Yeah, it wasn't their wisdom, it was wisdom that they were facilitating you to understand, right? But because it was that contaminated source, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Lots of people do that and come to Dharma centers. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you start treating your llamas that way, it could be the same problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Uh, the, uh... I can sit several hours every day, mm -hmm. just meditate and I work and actually I don't have time to practical things in my home. <laughs> sure. Just I want to just meditate when you meditate. And it goes on in several years. I can't figure out still then I get lose the power. Oh, I got. I have to do that, and I lose the energy. Mm. But other side, I love to meditate. Sometimes I think maybe I should go to some temple just meditate every day. <laughs> I don't know. I what is going on? I don't know. What is, What is your goal of meditation? What is your goal? Because when I feel meditate, I feel alive. Mm -hmm. And every time I meditate, it's like something volcano is going on. Just little, little uh, left, then I 
Are you using it as entertainment? <laughs> is your meditation your entertainment for you? Is this your form of entertainment? Entertainment. Entertainment. Like TV. Like Are you playing with your chakras? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I think much more alive. Yeah. I mean it sounds it sounds like beautiful things are happening, right? It sounds like interesting beautiful things are happening. You have to stop and ask yourself, why do I meditate? Is it for the greater good or is it because it's very interesting for me only? Is it helping me be more open, more kind, more connected, more useful or is it just very nice for me only? Actually, it's both. Yeah, it's both. Then go for it. <laughs> go I for it. Like you don't make enough money to eat properly? No, no, no. Maybe I want to do something, but I don't do that because I don't have time. Yeah. Like, I want to just maintain. <laughs> sounds okay. Yeah. It sounds like my life. No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, some hobbies fall away when your practice becomes stronger. That's okay. Yeah, I think, okay, you check, but sounds like fine to me. Yeah, sounds like fine to me. You're still able to feed and clothe yourself. You haven't lost all touch of reality, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can feed yourself, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but just check. But yeah, ask yourself, what is the worry? What is my worry, really? What am I scared is the problem? Yeah, are you, are you worried about something that you're not doing? And you think you should do it? For example, I want to take a drive lesson. I don't care. Yeah. But I don't... Uh, maybe I'm lazy to do that because actually it could be very nice if mm. I have that. Mm -hmm. But I, don't, I feel I don't have time. I just yeah. do that. For example. For example, this doesn't seem like a bad priority. Yeah, I think prioritizing meditation over these lessons sounds okay. Yeah, um, you know, be nice to the people in your life and look after yourself so you can still be fed and housed. I think it's okay life. Yeah, you don't uh, do everything in terms of learning new skills, learning new languages, doing this, going there. You know, you know when you travel a little bit, you realize that everywhere has interesting culture, interesting buildings, interesting landscape, and you're like, yeah. So then what? <laughs> right? You know, if you go to Paris and are happy, it's not because Paris made you happy. Right? You decided this would make you happy. But if you put too much pressure on it, then you could be in Paris and very sad. You know, it's not the, these plans that we think we should do. You know, if I learned how to play the guitar, if I learned how to speak Italian, if I learned that, you know, maybe it will make you happy, maybe it won't. But after you do a bit of that, you know, you have to ask yourself, why? Yeah, I'm trying to get happiness from this. Are there quicker ways? <laughs> more sustainable ways? Um, ways that help more areas than just one? A little of that is fun maybe when you're young, but after a while maybe just meditating is better. Yeah? Yeah. Vicky? Maybe, maybe the act can be meditation too, right? You, you, you meditation with your or you can be meditating while you're doing your eyes. There's a film of meditation. You can add the film. Art? Art? Your eyes that you want to do? And then artistic? Artistic. You want to study art? Or no, 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 no. They, they just, I love art like that. But I don't know. It's like, yeah, it could be. Yeah, I think you can be in meditation with your eyes, like with mandalas or you know, and Yeah, what were you going to say? Oh, uh, just a reflection, but you think that yesterday we were popular, but 
And, uh, and I'm thinking maybe I'm not strict enough because to me it's like a, a, almost a, <laughs> a holiday. Uh, yeah, like something I avoid doing by meditating. Ah, uh, yeah. So I was just reflecting on what you're yeah. saying that it's like all these other things that you have to do, but mm. you know, we stop and come back to yourself and meditate. And, mm. and I think it's better for me, and because if I don't, I usually collapse. Yeah. So, but at the same time, it is a form of procrastination. Maybe, yeah. I mean, this is the point is that it's different person to person, you know? You're the one who has to check. What am I doing this instead of? Why am I doing this? Whatever it is. Meditation is not necessarily good or bad in and of itself. Work is not good or bad in and of itself. You just check, why am I doing this? Is it for the greater good? Am I meditating because having more clarity and stability of mind will help me be more effective in the good work I want to do in this life? Or is it because it's pleasant and I don't want to work? You know? Yeah. So you check. And then you choose based on that, checking. You know? Yeah. Now slowly, slowly, you know, you're just learning yourself a little bit. You know, there's this surface self that we're used to, but there's all these layers of motivation that maybe we haven't peeked into, you know? And uh, it's interesting, yeah? So these last two, this attachment one, uh, when we talked about it last night, it's very much um, entertainment and comfort fixation, kind of traditional words of laziness, but it also can be this like, um, both of these can kind of turn into this laziness of busyness, where you become very productive instead of doing what's important. Yeah, very productive doing many things, but not the thing that needs to be done internally or externally. So just checking sometimes when you get into a, a frenzy of activity. Yeah? Do you know this feeling when you're in a frenzy of activity, you're doing, 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 but it's actually kind of avoiding something? Yeah? And this laziness of despondency, there's two elements to it. One is that the work is too overwhelming or the goal is too overwhelming. And the other is that you don't think you're good enough or that the work is only for special, amazing people. So it can kind of go two ways. You either become kind of tired and deflated because suddenly how long this will take defeats you. Yeah, you realize the tiny baby steps to progress, the tiny baby steps to enlightenment, and you go, oh no, <laughs> right? Too hard. Or you say, this is a beautiful goal, this is beautiful things to aspire to, but I'm not good enough. This is only for spare, spiritual people or special people. So you see the two angles that can go. Sometimes then they come together in a lovely dance. But the despondency turns out making you stop everything and collapse. And one of the ways to antidote it is to think about Buddha nature. So you don't have to be Buddhist to kind of touch this idea. The idea is that your raw potential, the raw potential of your mind, is always able to be developed. That your mind can always learn something. Your mind can always grow. There's nothing that will kill your mind's ability to grow and transform. There are things that can kill your brain's ability to grow and transform, but the brain is not the mind. Do you understand? Okay, so if you are putting effort into transformation, you will have progress. Always. And if you put no effort into transformation, less so. <laughs> yes? I was just thinking about um, when it comes uh, to Adam Morris. Yeah. Meditation and uh, retreat. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was also saying that, you know, because we are so into the mode of working yeah. all of the time that it's like to, to go from working to meditation is such a, you know, kind of a, a task of itself. Yeah. So uh, that you, like, if you need the rest, if you have to yeah. sleep or, you know, then allow yourself to do that. So, mm. you know, and just be friendly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Friendly with accurate labeling. 
right? So when you're sleeping, call it sleeping. <laughs> Don't call it meditating. <laughs> yeah. 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 Also that you meditate in different positions. Yeah. 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 Like if you fall asleep, okay, you probably need it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But then I'm thinking that maybe you have this goal because I mean we're not necessarily coming from a tradition or or culture where we grew up in a step hills of a country watching sheep. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot more chaos. So much to process the impact that you can, you know. Not want to run the marathon like, yeah. straight away. Like, but Absolutely. No, there, there's a real skill in um, uh, having a step before doing the big thing that you want to do or the small version of the big thing, like meditation. To you know, like for example, when I live, I guess the only time I live a kind of a normal, conventional life, the way most people do, is when I live in Israel, because I have a little apartment and I drive to work and I teach sort of like a normal amount of time, like in a university sort of setting, and then I drive home. So that's sort of more like the way regular people are, I assume. I don't know what you do nowadays, but um, but you know, other times of the year, I might be at a Dharma center the whole time, or I might be traveling. But for this sort of four or five months each year, I you know have a house, I drive to work, I teach a normal length of time, and I come back. And so when I do this, my practice is a little bit different. Yeah, it's it has to become kind of the right pace and the right time. So if I come home from work and I've been teaching, you know, kind of advanced philosophy to argumentative Israeli people who I adore but are fiery, you know, and I love them very much, but they have a lot to say. Um, and when I get home, I can't meditate the second I get home. When I get home, I sit down and I drink a glass of water and that's it. Like, I don't look at anything, I don't read anything, I just sit in my chair and I drink a glass of water slowly and go, ha, that was a big day. Yeah, you know, and I've just driven through the traffic and you know, it's a whole thing, you know what this feeling is, yeah? If I'm to sit down and immediately try and meditate, I could trigger a panic attack because I'm so upregulated from all of the sensory input to kind of tell myself I have one more thing to do, could be a little bit zzz, you know? So what I, I just sit quietly and I drink a glass of water and sometimes I just walk around the house and think maybe I'll do some dishes doo, doo, doo. and I just do something physical and grounding for a little bit very simply you know and I have to work hard not to add something to entertain myself you know like don't also put on music don't all you know because also you're so stimulated that then to have less stimuli is uncomfortable for a minute right but just I let myself putter around the house for you know 15 minutes clean something sit and look at something drink some water just do to do you know, nothing in particular, and then I sit down and meditate, yeah? So it's just, it's about knowing that there's lag time and there's adjustment periods and to kind of pace it so that you, ha you give yourself moments of relief. And we talk about this a bit tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be about when and how to rest so that it actually is rejuvenating and when and how to kind of shine the light on what am I doing and why, the pacing of that. So tomorrow is much more about kind of logistics of how to put all of this into practice. But just the brief one is, is that if you are tired, rest, <laughs> right? If you are tired, rest. But it's the happy rest of I love my job, I love my life, I love what I'm doing in this world and I'm just working hard at it and I'm tired so I'm gonna rest so I can keep going. If I don't love my life, then rest becomes my holiday and becomes the thing I look forward to. You know, when you get yourself into that place where I'm really looking forward to this sleep because it's my only moment to myself, you know, or I'm really like, I need this because it's all I have. You know, if you get yourself into a life you don't love, rest becomes a little bit too important and entertainment becomes too vital because it's all you have. Yeah, and so just check, you know, are you living your life in order to have permission to be entertained and rest? Or is your life good and sometimes you add rest and entertainment? 
you know, what's the ma a bigger percentage? Yeah, and just checking and then adjusting. Yeah. So despondency relies on understanding Buddha nature, and Buddha nature really just means you have confidence that change is possible. Um, there's some confusion about what Buddha nature is or Buddha potential. Some people think you're already a Buddha, you just need to wake up to it. That's an oversimplification. Yeah. Imagine that your Buddha nature is like raw gold. Okay, raw gold, perfect, pure, raw gold, big chunk, yeah, gorgeous and cannot be contaminated. And then your negative states of mind, like anger and attachment and jealousy and ignorance and all that stuff, is like dirt on the top, which is covering its purity and preventing its potential to be shaped. So you have layers and layers of kind of dirt and crud, which is not you, it's extra bits, it's extra. And with thought transformation and meditation and purification and many things, you're washing it off and washing it off and washing it off and you come back to that pure lump of gold. And now you can shape it into something. It wasn't a perfect shape, but it was a perfect potential. Do you understand the difference? Yeah, so the mind is like that, where it has this amazing potential, but it's not a potential that's been actualized. It's not a potential that's been perfected yet. Yeah, you're, there's your natural purity, but then there's the need for that purity to be transformed into something productive and beneficial. Yeah? So, really what that boils down to in daily life is remembering that there are things you can do now that you didn't used to be able to do. There are ways of coping, there are types of resilience, there is knowledge that you have now that you didn't used to have, and you have it because you learned it. You learned it. It shows you you can learn and change. It seems so obvious, but we forget to remind ourselves that we have learned many things already that took some effort. Yeah, maybe some pain, maybe some tragedy, but we learned a thing or two in our life. Yeah, why would that ability stop now? Why? There's no need for it to stop now. It, we just perhaps have given less thought to it because maybe we're not in school anymore. Do you understand? So to think of love, compassion, resiliency, energy, all these things are skills like the skill of learning to drive a car or learning how to navigate the subway. These were skills that had to be learned and in the beginning they did not come naturally. When you first learned how to r drive a car, it wasn't just natural. You had to think about this mirror and that mirror and that mirror. You had to think about probably a gear shift or this, um, you know, you had to think about what is the speed, what is the fuel, all these things. You had to think about them on purpose, you know, you had to really like think to think about them. But then you drive for a few years and you just do those things automatically. Do you know what I mean? Right? So it wasn't like it was just natural, but now it's natural. The same is true with learning how to pace yourself and learning how to be happy, learning to be happy. You don't have to just naturally know how to be happy. Yeah? The things that we're taught our happiness are not. They're things that are conditions for momentary satisfaction. That's all we've been taught. Yeah, so you're learning a new thing. It's a new skill. You know, give yourself time and be, you know, interested and curious and just see what happens. Not too much pressure. So despondency happens when you think you can go faster than you can. And the problem is, is that your intelligence is much faster than your integration process. You will understand things way before you can do them. Yeah. Despondency comes when you think that they happen at the same time. Yeah, when you think that understanding something should mean that you do it, and then you don't, and you're sad and think it doesn't work, and give up. Yeah, when you lose faith in yourself because things aren't happening as quickly as you think they should, you don't even notice something is happening. How was I a year ago? How was I six months ago? You know, how was I before I met this one idea? You know, and checking back. 
And as, as time goes by and you start working on yourself, I think what your friends and family will notice is that you are kinder and happier. And, but internally, you might have gone through huge change. It just doesn't necessarily show itself right on the surface. But on the surface, they will notice you are kinder and you are happier. And that's enough, right? They don't have to know all of the amazing shifts and the cosmic shifts that have happened inside of you. Yeah, this is your process. But it's nice for them too. Yeah, so, so managing despondency means that you're managing expectations, that you're interested in what happens next, not pushing for what happens next. And maybe even not even worried about next, if you can. Just what's happening right now today, if I bring a bigger worldview to it. Does it sort of make sense? All right. So despondency really is like stagnation. It's like feeling stuck. Yeah, because you have no air left or no energy left. And if you've really gone deeply into it, you will just need some recovery time before you try anything new. And so, you know, rest is the thing to do if you really pushed it to full-on despondency. But if you can kind of just gently while resting, you know, be on your couch, be in a floppy position, be in your pajamas, think, do you know what? That one time I learned something. That was hard. Hmm, maybe this time I'm learning something because that was hard. <laughs> what am I learning from this about the nature of the human condition? I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm not going to put any pressure on myself about it. I'm just going to go back over what am I learning from this? Yeah. Just very gently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any questions about that before we do the meditation about despondency? I've got one. Sure. Um, I've come in contact with a lot of young people, well, teenagers to older teenagers. Well, people in general. And my motivation is to try and encourage them that this life that we're part of sometimes in the systems I'm involved with doesn't have to be the all, the be all and end all. Mm. And so I try and encourage that, yeah, we can change um, the, the way that we are, the way that we're involved, the systems we're part of, maybe not right now. Mm. Or we can change the way that we relate to those um, program? Yeah, yeah. Am I on the right track with this, or is yeah. it like way off, off cue? Well, you know, it's it's hard to know without seeing the specific s circumstance, but it sounds sounds good. Sounds good. I just feel like there's a lot of young people born with so much wisdom and yeah. trust in humanness. I don't want to um, crush that because uh, it's too grow, right? And yeah. So I feel like my motivation is to teach people that we can still hold on to that. We don't have to let it yeah. be a crushing. I don't know if I'm way off, or if that's just way pie in the sky, but <clears throat> I don't know. I feel like it's new but old. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And I want to keep encouraging that motivation in people rather than crush it and say, yeah, this is all there is to life. Yeah, because absolutely. Yeah, I think um, that while at the same time acknowledging that many people's priorities are different sure. and, and how to be patient and non-judgmental oh, about really? that. Yeah, 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 sounds good to me. Okay, sounds good to me. Nice <laughs> one. <laughs> okay, so this meditation is, is one of those um, checking through your past kind of ones. So what you're going to try and do is find yourself when you're each of these and also find yourself when you're the opposite so that it becomes much clearer and more obvious to you the way the two sides of you function. Okay, so I'll walk you through it and um, just see how you go experimentally. So it's an analytical meditation and we'll start with uh, just a minute or two of breathing just to settle. Okay, so again thinking in order to be of greatest benefit to myself and others, I'm going to explore this meditation and start with bringing your focus to the breath.
And when distractions arise, just notice them and come back to the breath, gently disengaging. And so now think about a time in your life or a way you have of being when you're really putting off something that needs to be done. And you either become very busy with other things or you become very distracted and paralyzed doing nothing. But just what are you like? when you start to procrastinate? What does it feel like in your body? What does it feel like in your mind when you're putting things off? <coughs> Just look through your memory. When you're procrastinating, is your mind very busy and very quick with all sorts of ways to avoid things? Or is your mind very paralyzed and quiet and shut down, disassociated? It doesn't matter which one, just try and notice what is it like in there when you're procrastinating? How do you get? And so imagine taking a mental snapshot of that place, that procrastinating side of yourself, and just gently compare it to those times when you felt very efficient and energetically happy in the middle of a task, enjoying it. When maybe at first you were intimidated but then you started and got on a roll and started to enjoy yourself. It might have been difficult to organize yourself, but once you did, the flow that occurred. So just try and find a place in your mind or in your memories when that's happened, when you didn't procrastinate. And imagine standing back from both of these snapshots and saying both of these are responses. Both of these come about through many causes and conditions. It's not good to punish myself for one or reward myself for the other 
let me just very objectively ask, which way is more effective? Which way am I happier? <clears throat> and imagine that you lift out of one habit, the habit of procrastinating, and drop down into when you're more efficient, when you're more motivated, the happier place of more benefit. And then think about the times when you've been very attached to sensory pleasures, very attached to little entertainments and comforts. And because you were so engrossed in those things, you didn't do the big thing. Satisfied with the crumbs of happiness, you didn't make the cake of happiness. Just look at when do you get the laziness of attachment? What does it look like for you? A way of collapsing? A way of binging? Just explore it. And try and remember what it feels like when you really let yourself indulge in these things, when you had something very important to do, something you maybe enjoyed doing, but you didn't do it because you got lost in attachment. How do you feel when you ran out of time? And contrast that to the times when you've been maybe intrigued or tempted by ordinary happinesses and pleasures, little treats you can give yourself, but decided that working on the spiritual path, working on relationships, working on positive work was actually more worth your time. And you were able to shake off the temptation of attachment and go into something more beneficial. Just try and think of a time when you chose differently. What is it like in your mind? And imagine lifting out of that temptation of ordinary sensory things and dropping into the bigger picture, greater benefit way of living.
And then remember that way you get when you feel defeated and despondent because your expectations were too high. Either too much expectations of yourself or too much expectations of how quick the goal would come about. And you got despondent and sad and bitter. See if you can touch that place without falling into that place. Just remembering what it's like. The way it gives you an excuse not to try anymore. The way it makes you feel jaded and alienated. But also the way it is not true. that change is always possible with gentle, consistent, wise effort. Our mistake is in the pacing <coughs> attachment exaggerates what's possible and how fast and by whom And so remember those times when you've had a very practical, very large picture and decided to start very gently and slowly something worthwhile. It could be as a parent helping your children learn to walk and learn to speak. You knew it would take some time but repetition and patience would get you there. It could be you towards yourself in learning a new ability. But just find that place in yourself that can have steady effort. The way it feels when you relax into patience. And imagine disconnecting from that despondency and dropping into the practicality of the large view, the long view. Faith in your ability to change and grow. and think through the effort we put into this practice today. May we develop joyous effort and overcome the three types of laziness in order to develop our potential to its utmost extent.
Okay. So just have a, a little think about all that if you feel like it, or just give it space and just give yourself a really easy night um, and let it kind of digest in the background. You might want to just kind of give it some room and we'll come back to it tomorrow. And um, we'll just quickly do the, the dedication prayers here in your um, prayer booklet. It's on uh, page four. At the back on page four. Okay, thanks everybody.